This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Okay, here I am on cracked.com. What happens if I type medieval on the search engine? Search. Oh my god. What have I done? Hey, noble ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking, and today we are here back with more articles because, as I said in my previous iteration, this is episode 3 now, I never learn, but I'm gonna be honest with you, I also do this because I find it fun, I enjoy it, I might need professional help. Okay, so we are back on Cracked, which is this website where I found quite a lot of articles that were telling us and sort of debunking myths about ancient Rome, about ancient Greece, and you can already find lots of like thumbnails and links in the description to the way I addressed these articles that oftentimes, rather than the debunking myths, they are in fact spreading their own to the point that the myths that they're talking about oftentimes are actually not myths at all. So today I had this idea. <laughs> I know. What can I say? I'm too much pasta. Today I had this idea. What happens if I literally go into Cracked and type Medieval in the search engine? And here we are, Pandora's box. And these are not old articles. 2022, 2019, 2022, 2022 again. This is just a trend. It means they're getting views. Let's push out as many articles as we can on the medieval period. I, I mean, I spent all morning reading this. I mean, let me tell you, it was it was fun, but I do need, do need a drink. There are some articles that say stuff that is completely out there and then you'll see, but other articles, they tell you quite a few correct things that you can see that the person who is writing, they probably watched the community of the sword because I see that they're repeating verbatim stuff said by me, Shad, Matt Easton, Scalagrim, Lindy Beige, which suggests that they don't really do their own research, which sometimes can be problematic because some of the stuff they say is correct, but then it's followed by what I think is their own interpretation or something that they are pushing that is then incorrect. Let me show you. Let's just jump right in. The first article I'd like to briefly look at is the article called Five Realities of Medieval Warfare Hollywood Refuses to Learn. The issue I take is with the following point. Point number four is titled, Seriously, you are not stabbing through armor. That's a great start, right? Well, here is the problem. He says, far from the ease with which movie warriors can cleave through an enemy, medieval armor was actually pretty much impervious to medieval weaponry. Good point. That shouldn't be that surprising though. The entire point of armor is to protect the wearer from the kinds of things they'd encounter out in the world. It is the predominant weapons of the day. Now, so far, so good, right? Because usually we had the opposite problem when people say that armor, you know, doesn't work. So that's great. However, wait for it. If someone's coming at you with a sword, you wear sword-proof clothing. Duh. <laughs> I hate the way they write these. It's not like soldiers gave up plate armor randomly or because the fashion changed. They did it because cannons started exploding the hell out of them, metal, cod pieces and all. And that's where I have a problem. Before gunpowder ruined everything, armored knights and men-at-arms were basically walking colossuses. And then they go on saying that armor wasn't that heavy, you can move, and that's all correct. The only problem is, I don't know how many times I have to say this, gunpowder and firearms, the invention of firearms, did not cancel out armor. So as you can see, they are removing some myths by replacing them with another myth. And this is not the only article saying this. Check this out. On the article 18 medieval myths you believe because of movies, they bring up a similar point on point number four. Myth, you can just slice through plate armor, it's fine. What's the point of wearing armor if a dude is going to slice right through it? With a sword or puncture it with an arrow? Well, it makes for a great action scene, but no one would bother wearing armor in real life if it was an in as ineffective as it appears in film. And, and again, I very much agree with this. In fact, I think they're just repeating stuff that they heard. I'm not saying from me, but from someone in the community of the swords, the bias cap wall, whatever you. Real armor was above all practical and did in fact protect the people inside at least until the invention of firearms. Why do I say that this is replacing a myth with another myth? Because we have a plethora of evidence that early firearms and full plate armor coexisted in the medieval period. I don't think people realize how early gunpowder started to be used already in the late 14th century, in the early 15th century, the first one-shot pistols and the first types of firearms were already used. As you continue into the 15th century, into the 16th century, firearms of course develop, but armor is not abandoned. If anything, smiths even tried to make it thicker. 
And one thing that is interesting is that as you read medieval treatises, uh, you'll notice that people that are using these sort of early types of firearm are advised to shoot a point blank where they are shooting at someone in full plate armor. Why? Because otherwise the armor will protect them. To the point that even early cuirassiers and other types of full plate knights that were also using firearms were advised to literally touch your opponent's helmet and even cuirass with your firearms before discharging. So this idea that the moment firearms entered the medieval equation, they started shooting at knights and knights in full plate armor started falling like flies is wrong. Of course, eventually, as centuries and centuries go by, the development of firearms continues to a point whereby the medieval type of full plate armor just doesn't work anymore. But then again, cuirasses will keep at least a cuirass for a very long time and way into cannon warfare, if you want to call it that way. Not necessarily because they thought that they could be protected from cannons, but because it could protect them from many other types of weapons that could still harm you and your armor would still work very well. I'll give you the reference in the description. This is a very famous piece of iconography that even shows how to early cuirassiers in full plate armor, whom have probably lost their horses, their mounts during the battle, are going at each other with early firearms and they are still wearing full plate armor. So no, firearms did not cancel out armor. And if you allow me to be a slightly bit more pedantic about this, then we should say that firearms even today didn't cancel out armor. We still use armor. It just has evolved. I mean, Kevlar, blade carriers, all of that is armor. And if you want to argue and say, yeah, but that's not metal armor, I understand. But what about titanium plating on tanks and warplanes? Armor was never removed from the equation by the invention of firearms. It just evolved as it always has. Now, if you're like me and you like surfing the internet looking for articles to read, then a good thing to do is to do it in safety. And that's why you should definitely use today's sponsor. Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted channel and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists and among other things it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online accounts, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any country regardless of where you are. So let's say you wanted to watch a show that they only broadcast in the UK, but you were in America, no problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I personally always have Atlas VPN active on my machines because one account lets you use unlimited devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice but also because it's very affordable and that links to today's offer for you. You can get a three-year subscription to Atlas VPN for just $1.83 per month plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Now if you were considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, well now it's the time to make use of this special time offer and get Atlas VPN for a ridiculously low price, but make sure you do it quickly since this is a time limited offer. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's just $1.83 a month for a 3 year subscription plus 3 months for free with a 30 day money back guarantee. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. Let's go to the next one. Myth number 17 on this list. It was only in Europe and everyone was white. So they're saying the Middle Ages were only Europe and everyone was white is a myth. And here we are with what I think really is the goal of these articles. Peppering stuff with real information and then they put this. Movies set in 500 to 1500 are overwhelmingly based in Europe and featured all or almost all white casts, but obviously lots of things were going on worldwide. Okay, your point being, <laughs> I mean, if I decide to, to, if I choose as a filmmaker to set a movie in medieval Europe, that doesn't mean that I don't think that anything else is happening in the world. So I understand all these, oh my gosh. This time period included the fascinating Heian period in Japan and the Islamic Golden Age in the Middle East and North Africa. It was also when the African empires of Mali and Benin got their start. Great. All of this is completely relevant. If you are setting a movie in medieval Europe, guess what? That movie is going to talk about medieval Europe. 
which would become some of the richest kingdoms in the world, holding records to this very day. And that's fantastic for a movie set in that period. So if this was a way to say too many movies have been set in the medieval period in Europe, we should set them in the Heian period in Japan or in whatever period in Africa, I, I have nothing against that, but that doesn't mean that as they try to put it, it was only in Europe. Yes, the Middle when you say the Middle Ages, usually you, it's incorrect to refer to the Heian period as the Middle Ages in Japan. No one does it, people don't do it, it's not the way historians call it. Usually when you say the Middle Ages, you're talking about European history. Of course, that doesn't mean that nothing has happened around the world, whether, whether it was for the Islamic Golden Age or any other country. That I think people understand that. But anyways, let, let's continue. I don't want to get... I'm, I'm starting to get like, you know, yeah, I'm going to need a drink very soon. In the Americas, the Incas Empire was getting started and the Maya had been established for nearly a thousand years. In what will become New Mexico, yeah, okay. I'm going to apply the same logic you're using to you. The writer of this article is going out of his way to try and say, oh look, they always, when you talk about medieval period, the medieval period, you always talk about Europe, but you should talk about Africa, and you should talk about the Middle East, and you should talk about Japan and South America. Well, let me ask you, why did you not mention Indonesia? What was Indonesia doing in the 1300s? Why did you not mention India? What about China? Are you excluding all of these people? Are you being racist towards these people? I'm applying the exact same logic you're applying to, medi to the term medieval to what you are doing. You didn't include everyone. Here is where this is really going. Even in Europe, it would not be uncommon to see different people from different places, especially in the larger cities, as trade routes expanded and travel became easier. Actual art from the period itself also reflects its diversity. And this is what this is about. Just like the video I made, ancient Rome was a very diverse and uh, multicultural and multi-ethnic place. They're trying to do it the same thing with medieval Europe. It's not the only article that tries to do this, but what's funny, <laughs> let me show you, is as you can see, reflects its diversity is clickable. So let's try and click it. Let's see what, what, what it says. Oops, that page does not seem to exist. <laughs> Go figure. Let me show you from another article. Hollywood myths cracked four things movies get wrong about medieval times. Here's another article. Very similar in the way it's organized. Peppering occasional correct information and then going for what they're really trying to say. So they say things like medieval folks weren't dirty all the time, which was, of course, the, the idea that everyone in the Middle Ages was dirty is incorrect and it has been debunked. So they are right about that. Point number one, medieval Europe was way more diverse. There has been a lot of renewed talk following the new The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power series featuring a more diverse cast than the original movies ever did. And as it should, because medieval Europe, excuse me a second, <laughs> excuse me a second, you're talking about The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is not set in medieval Europe. The Lord of the Rings is set in Middle Earth. Spoiler alert, Middle Earth does not exist. Given Obviously, Tolkien took a lot of inspiration from the European Middle Ages as basically every fantasy that is a fairly sort of medieval looks to it did, like D&D, what have you, The Witch, I mean, they all clearly stem from this idea of a romanticized fantasy rendition of a kingdom that appears to be clearly based in medieval European architecture, style, armor, weapons and everything else. Bringing up the Lord of the Rings as a representation of medieval Europe is weird. Now, I will make a dedicated video on Tolkien and his views. But today, I don't, don't want to do this. I just want to underline this connection that he's saying medieval Europe was a melting pot of race and diversity in connection with so should the Lord of the Rings be, even though, again, Lord of the Rings is not set in medieval Europe. What they are saying is the usual stuff. Check this out. The Rings of Power series featuring a more diverse cast than the original movies ever did, as and as it should, because medieval Europe was a melting pot of race diversity. Racial slavery wasn't a thing yet. Oh my gosh, racial slavery wasn't a thing. And yet people were living together in close communities as peacefully as they possibly could. I don't, I really don't understand what these article writers, what these politically charged and motivated speakers are trying to do. I don't get it. Because trying to remove things that actually happened in the past and the way POC were miscreated over the years and over the centuries and trying to put them in a position where, oh no, it never happened and don't you ever say the word slavery 
in connection with a person of color that's racist and don't you dare say that they went through all of these things. No, you need to pretend that everyone loved each other, people didn't even see race, they were I need to read it again. They were all living together in close communities as peacefully as they possibly could and medieval Europe was a melting pot. No. Medieval Europe was mostly white. Yes, there were people of color. And yes, you will see representations of that. You even have a guy in full plate armor who is clearly black. These are exotic people to the original inhabitants of Europe, which were light skinned. Trying to change the queens and kings of medieval Europe and making them black because you want to right a wrong, I guess, because of all the things that people of color had to endure is not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to tell the story how it was. Don't try and force an over-exaggerated diversity and saying that Europe was a melting pot so you would have seen as many black people, as white people, as Indians, I guess, as Asians. Everyone was the same. Everyone, every city had the same exact amount. I know that they didn't say this, but understand where I'm coming from. This isn't the right way to do it. it later on says this, however, doesn't mean that there wasn't any racism going on back then, which is interesting because it just said racial slavery didn't, wasn't a thing, so kind of two things don't really connect well in my mind. In fact, it would seem that some writers of the time set the tone and discourse that would eventually lead to dehumanizing justification of enslavement, blah blah blah. The point is that Europe wasn't all white in medieval times, and the belief that it was has been causing trouble for more than a century. Europe was overwhelmingly white. This is an incorrect notion that they're clearly trying to push. Scholars officially picked up, I love it that they never say the names of these scholars, officially picked up a link between modern white supremacy and the false idea that everyone in Europe was white during the Middle Ages. No one says that everyone was white. Of course you had people traveling, of course you had thralls, of course you had prisoners of war, of course you had merchants, of course you had traders, you had all sorts. But yes, it was overwhelming in white. I don't think anyone with a clear brain would say that there was the, the only people that existed in Europe were 100% white people, or white Europeans. From the article, six ridiculous myths about the Middle Ages everyone believes. Well, let's see, because I, I, I suppose I should believe it too. When you think of the Middle Ages, chances are you picture gallant knights sitting astride brilliant destriers, galloping through a sea of plagues, ignorance and filth. And you can hardly be blamed for that when everyone from the movies you watch to your high school history teacher, who was mainly the football coach, <laughs> oh gosh, has told you so. Well, great. Let's see the reality. Let's look at point number four. It's always point number four for some reason. One of there is a mathematical reason to do that. Knights were honorable, chivalrous warriors. The myth. Knights were gallant and brave warriors charging into battle to slay the dragon. Seriously. And rescue the fair maiden. I don't think anyone believed... Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think that... I, I find it funny how they depict the people who believe said myths in the stupidest way possible. Like, this is how stupid people are. They believe that the dragons were around. The reality. Knights often had less in common with this. Mm -hmm. I don't actually see anything wrong with that. It's a duel for a girl. It happened. Absolutely happened. And more in common with this. For some reason there is a gang of youngsters. Remember, knights were professional warriors. Well, first and foremost, I think the way he's using knights is not exactly correct. Men at arms were professional warriors. Knights were mounted nobility. So, were they professional warriors? Well, they were definitely professional at what they were doing, but they weren't doing it for the money. If you say knight, it means that he has received a title of knightship. And again, I know this is a little pedantic, but I'm not really saying it to necessarily attack this person's writing. It's just a little bit of an explanation because I think that this person doesn't exactly understand how to use the, the term knight correctly. Someone who is a knight is someone who has been titled. So someone who has been titled is not really doing it for a profession, it's doing it for a lot of other reasons. Knights will do it for scutage, uh, which is basically like a necessary tax that you need to pay to the king. Uh, you either pay the tax or go to war. <laughs> if you don't want to go to war, which is a duty, uh, then you can pay money. But a knight is much more than a professional warrior. It's also a professional warrior in the sense that he's professional in the way he's doing it, and that's what he does, but that's not the only thing a knight does. A knight will do many, many other things. So that was just a little clarification that I wanted to slip in there. A man at will be a better definition of a professional warrior depending on the period and the country, mostly because they fight in the manner of the knight, but they're not necessarily titled. Remember, knights were professional warriors, and when there wasn't a war to fight, they had to find something to do with their war bones. 
well, bonus, sorry. Most of these guys were relatively young and didn't have Call of Duty to satisfy their violent urges, so they tended to take it out on the local population towards 11th century, and at already 11th century is very early, it's very, it's like really the beginning um, of the concept of night the way we understand it. Not sure if that's great exemplification of this. Many of the local lords started bickering over who would get a slice of the Holy Roman pie the Charlemagne baked. And the knights were at the forefront of these petty wars. It's interesting they call them petty wars. This seems to me a little bit of presentism right there. Their wars were petty. Our wars are fine. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but it wouldn't surprise me since that's the kind of stuff that I've seen already. Presentism is definitely part of this. These wars were less Braveheart-style epic battles and more knights rolling up into villages and slaughtering everybody, but wars with full-on battlefields, country versus country, that existed. The medieval period was full of full-on wars, not all wars were like, just go around and burn villages. Here is another one, the article is called Prima Nocta, the weird medieval marriage law that didn't exist. So I appreciate that already put in the title that it didn't exist, because in fact it didn't exist. And what they call Prima Nocta is, so this idea of a medieval lord is gonna interrupt the wedding of a couple that is like the farmers or peasants and what have you, and he just takes the bride and says, I have the right to have sex with her on the first night because of my Prima Nocta. Yeah, that's all a myth. I wish they used the correct Latin for it though because Prima Nocta is wrong. So I don't know how much I can believe about this if they couldn't even find out how it was written. So in Latin it would be Ius Primae Noctis. Uh, notice that I'm spelling it with a J. Yes, it's fine to use a J because the J was in fact created as an elongated I with a little curve by the ancient Romans, so there's nothing wrong with using a J. If you want to see a video about that, link in the description, lots of links today. Look, Ranieri a Polymathy has a dedicated video to that. But yeah, Primae Noctis, Prima Nocta, it's grammatically wrong in Latin. Obviously, I'm gonna leave also the links to all these articles. This article is generally speaking, apart from the Latin correct, um, it's not as strong as it should be. In fact, it sort of pushes it in a way that it like, maybe, maybe it didn't exist, but we're not exactly sure. It, yeah, it didn't exist. But if you wanna check it out, feel free. I have nothing against this article anyways, apart from the Latin. Okay, but there are many other articles, so I might need to make a part two. For today, I think I'd like to stop here. If you found any, any article like this, let me know. Please give me the title of the article, don't give me a link in the, in the, in the comments, because I don't click links in the comments, but feel free to tell me the title of the, of the article you want me to check out and review, and I'll be more than happy to do that. Don't forget to check out the offer that Atlas VPN has for you today. It's a limited time offer, so you wanna check that one out as soon as possible. Thank you very much much for watching and remember the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. <laughs>